The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss. It's so exciting to be able to introduce you to this movement, the March to the Guillotine by Berlioz from his Symphony Fantastique. There are a few introductory words to say about this, just thinking about the entire scope of this symphony and what this movement's place is in it and what its origin was. In fact, this march was originally composed as part of an opera that Berlioz was working on and eventually abandoned, and it was adapted to this particular symphony. So there really is a different feel to it, a different kind of a vibe. And in fact, looking at the entire scope of the symphony, there's a certain pattern in which you see this movement fits in really, really well. You probably noticed that the first movement was fairly long, and so was the third movement. But that second movement, based on the dance, a real crowd pleaser, something that would really interest the common public that would come to listen to this symphony, was much shorter, just a few minutes. And the same thing is true of this march as well. And this march is also a real crowd pleaser. It's sometimes played on its own, just as an extra piece on a program. And I feel when you look at this little comment down here at the bottom of the page by H.B., Hector Berlioz, you can see that he's thinking ahead to that. He's saying, you may, for this particular movement, double the wind instruments. I don't know about eight bassoons, but certainly adding an extra pair of flutes, oboes, and clarinets would help to balance some of the massive brass that arises later in this movement. Another thing that's worth looking at before we start is the tempo. Allegretto non troppo. Well, this is a march, so they are marching Berlioz to the scaffold. <laughs> and that is because, in his imagination, he has murdered the object of his affection because of jealousy. A very ancient concept of masculinity. And at this tempo, what you will detect is a certain kind of irony. Yes, there are some tragic moments, as you'll hear with the first passage of Bassoon Soli bemoaning one's state, but the overall sense of majesty and positivity, <laughs> almost an enforced positivity, brings to mind, at least for me, the idea that Berlioz is being marched to the scaffold and he's got this big army around him, this big guard of troops, and they're playing this merry march behind him, this very positive march, and he's looking out at the crowds and he's thinking to himself, well, <laughs> that's life, right? There's a certain sense of acceptance and not really resisting his fate, but going along with it because, damn it, that's just the way things turned out and there's nothing he can do about it but just face his fate with a lot of courage. That is the sense that you get at this tempo. Now that is Berlioz's assigned tempo, and that's the way that this movement should be played. However, what's very interesting is to go watch this one live performance of Roger Norrington, which I have linked in the info, and to listen to his tempo. He takes it at a little bit under this 
half note equals 72. And what's amazing about that is that it immediately changes the temperature. You really get the idea that this is a death march. It's not necessarily tragic, but it changes the sense of irony to one of being ominous. And that is really worth comparing to Berlioz's original intentions. Something you'll also hear in that particular recording are Ophiclides, because he's touring with his orchestra, which is dedicated to original instruments and practices of that time. Now, he may have been slowing down the tempo a little bit, just because that's what he felt like after a lifetime of performing this work, or just because of the hall. Sometimes different tempos fit different halls a little bit better. Maybe he felt at a faster speed, it was just echoing a little too much. You never know. There are a bunch of different reasons why tempos can speed up or slow down between conductors and concert halls and orchestras. But I feel that he slowed it down just for that effect, for that emotional character. So let's take a look at the instrumentation. Doubled flutes, doubled oboes, doubled clarinets in C. If you watched the opening lecture for this series, you'll remember that he has clarinets in B-flat in the previous movement, and now he has a piece that is in two flats, and he opts for clarinets in C. And I feel that is because of the brighter character of the clarinets. And it also leaves the first clarinet player with a nicely warmed up C clarinet for probably the most demanding movement of this symphony. Of course, the second has to change to an E flat, and that doesn't necessarily help them, but that's all right. However, the <laughs> one problem for a score reader who is used to reading B flat clarinet is to untranspose everything, to look at these B-flats, for instance, on this page, and to remember that they really are B-flats. Sounding, let's say, compared to these bassoons on the space above this bass staff. B-flat horns, first and second, and E-flat horns, third and fourth. B-flat trumpets, that fits the key signature perfectly. And also the cornets are in B-flat. And now finally, we have the addition of the trombones. Notice that Berlioz asks for an alto trombone, but it's scored with a tenor clef. Then second and third trombones scored in bass clef. Then two ophoclides. Generally speaking, as you may remember from the opening lecture, ophoclides are usually played by tuba players. And it's awesome to have two tuba players <laughs> playing in a symphony like this. It really has an amazing low end. Whereas the ophoclides themselves are not the strongest instrument. They can sound awesome in their own way, but it's more for their timbre that they sound unique or interesting rather than necessarily their strength. Now we've got our timpani, three timbaliers, three timpani players. We've got our B flat and F played by one, a, a G, and D, timpani played by another, and then one timpani also playing the pitch of G. This big long line of text here in French is basically telling the player to hit the drum with two beaters at the same time whenever they see two stems. That's all that means. And that's a fairly common notation today. Spongy baguettes. In other words, soft beaters. Now, another thing that I mentioned is that later on in this movement, there is 
a marking that the mutes should come off. And since there is no marking that the timpani should be muted, it is sometimes mentioned at the beginning of this movement that the timpani are to be muted. But my feeling about it is, since the previous movement ended with distant thunder rumbling from either side of the stage, that perhaps the mutes were intended to be added at that time, and then just kept on until the middle of this particular movement. Who knows? And then we've got symbols. This would be the symbol pair, bass drum, and snare drum. Obviously, this is a big march, so we want some snare drum and bass drum. And then just the typical lineup of strings, but as you'll see, they do untypical things right from the very beginning, which we'll talk about in a second. So let's start off with those timpani. The fact that one group of timpani is on one side of the stage and another group is on the other side of the stage is going to become very important later on in this movement. For now, though, what's great about that positioning, if the orchestra decides to do it, is that you sense the drums really surrounding you. If you've got your B-flat drum over up against the left wall and the G drum over against the right wall of the stage, really makes a difference. Now, of course, as you'll see in most performances, they don't do that anymore. And I think that's a shame. I know that it's difficult on some orchestras to find the space on stage with such a sprawling symphony such as this one, especially getting towards the later movements where it adds more and more brass and so on. And there are four bassoon players and a bunch of other things going on. Two tubas. But all the same, I think that if they can make the space that they should do this, they should separate the timpani on either side. The other thing that's cool about this, this is a big march, and it has a very military feel to it. And yet the percussion that starts the movement out is not a snare drum and a bass drum. It is the timpani, and that has a wonderful effect to it. Notice that the timpani are playing this G minor third, and that is also ominous. It's very difficult to really feel that tonality, to to really hear the sense of minor right there, because the lower drum will tend to blot out the identity of the upper drum. However, to bolster up the sense of G minor, Berlioz has got pizzicato lower strings, and especially the double basses playing this big divisi in four pizzicato on this G minor octave chord. And that will continue on with the lower strings plucking away at different chord changes and different positions. Notice that when the music changes to a B-flat major chord here, the tonality in the timpani changes to B-flat on the bottom now, and then D above, coming from that right side timpani player. Okay, well, this is just the background to this awesome stuff that's going on here in our stopped horns. Stopped horn sound is one of the most interesting effects you can get from the horn if you're not familiar with it yet. Basically, the player is stuffing their hand into the bell, stopping the normal outflow of air from the inside of the instrument. And it gives the horn a very snarly, somewhat distant sound. The sound of approaching menace, if you will. Berlioz has got to do all of these real interesting calculations harmonically in order for everything to work. And he does tend to cheat a little bit, and I'll point some of those things out. These are pitches that are available on stopped horns anyways. For instance, in order to get this G-sharp here, or this D-sharp and F-sharp right there, 
The G is a normal pitch that you can get from a natural horn, and so is the E. And of course, this sounds down a major sixth, right? So really what you're hearing down here is not a G, but a B flat down a sixth. And then of course the E that you've got here is sounding down to G. So basically that's a B flat sixth. By squeezing the pitch and adjusting it with the lip and the breath and the way that the note is stopped with the right hand, these little compromises in pitch can be achieved. Now, to steady things along, I think is really, really important here, Berlioz brings in the bassoons. And here you can see the role of the bassoon in working with the horns in a situation like this, where the harmony isn't just all ones and fives, and the occasional five of five. That's another thing about this that is so great. You could see Mozart in his final symphonies starting to explore the potential of putting different tunings of horns together in order to explore different harmonic directions in his symphonies. And here Berlioz has really taken that idea and run with it. Beethoven also did that to a degree. But here Berlioz is just really taking that as permission to squeeze out <laughs> certain directions in harmony from his natural horns. And I'm sure that he loved the idea of the valve horn giving him the ability to go in different harmonic directions later in life. However, there were a lot of people who did not like the sound of the valve horn and they felt there was a certain purity to the natural horn that was lost. Well, I think that's debatable, really. So this progresses onwards, changing to a B-flat chord. And really simple here, these are just B-flat octaves, aren't they? And then here, with our B-flat horns, these are D-thirds. So that just gives you a beautiful B-flat major chord right in here. And then we've got our voicing of a 6-3 chord right in here with the mediant on the bottom. And this is very cool right in here. <laughs> this C minor 7th chord, really great. It's our little jazz chord right in there before the harmony goes to the 5-7, which is cool. Right here we've got our C at the bottom. Just really amazing voicings right in here. Very forward looking. Since we're going to the five and we're going to underline it, that right hand timpani is going to be pounding away at that D, really sort of taking over because none of the other instruments are playing pitches that really fall into that scheme. So it's perfectly fine just to have this one single timpani play. And I feel it brings some clarity right in there, because whenever you add two timpani together like this, as you noted from the beginning of this movement, it tends to take away that clarity. Finally, we have the ophiclide and the third trombone come in. And this part could be played by a bass trombone very easily. This really does make the voicing feel more just like a root chord because that C at the bottom won't be perceived very well by the ear of the audience, but it's great that it's still there. And then doubling that F sharp, we've got second bassoon and so on, and an actual A from a C clarinet, looking at that and not having to transpose it to anything else, sounding this or sounding that. And really beautiful scoring here in the horns, resulting in pretty much the same voicing that we're seeing right in here with the seventh at the bottom, which in this case would be A sounding middle C, right? And then E flat in the position of F sharp being scored enharmonically here just for the convenience of the player because that is the pitch that they have to correct in order to get that particular note because that's the step along the harmonic series that they would have to correct in order to get that pitch. And then 
Of course, this is just a D fifth sounding. Finally, we have this big push, which I feel is just so amazing. You feel everything grow along with our gradually increasing timpani, which shouldn't be done in the sense that they all crescendo at the same rate. I feel that the timpani should already be building, and then this catches up with it with a sudden push. And then the pizzicato comes in here with the rest of the strings, really preparing the ear for this big tutti chord. Pow! No upper winds. Right here, a C third sounding B flat third. These E naturals here sounding G. These B flat trumpets sounding B flat, so you're getting heavy emphasis on the median here. Here we've got our root being played with A2 cornets on a G. And then D, B flat, and G. Just a nice plainly scored G minor chord. G at the bottom here from our Ophiclides slash tuba. And the timpani returning back to that G minor third. And then of course some nice voicings here in the strings. These can all be played as double stops, especially this B flat sixth and what is essentially just open strings here, uh, G fifth in our violas. Once again, the basses are being kept up rather than down. This could easily be scored with the cellos doubling the Ophiclides the second bassoon and the left hand side timpani, but instead they're playing up an octave and the double basses are doubling that pitch rather than an octave lower. It's such a cool page. Let's have a listen to it now. So listen for all of those things. The big hammer blow here at the end, the way that the timpani have this crescendo, and then the other instruments push from behind, and then there's suddenly this crescendo molto with the timpani going nuts, pushing towards this big tutti chord. Notice that the second timpani is intended to show up as forte rather than fortissimo. And it's really the winds and the brass and the second timpani that are meant to be playing with the most force right in here. Berlioz is soft pedaling the strings to a degree. He wants that quality in the chord, but he doesn't necessarily want it to be a big strings chord. I don't think that that's really necessary today, especially considering how much stronger <laughs> winds and brass have gotten since Berlioz's time. So I would just have this all played fortissimo, and that would be the general approach, I think, of most orchestras. Listen for how the trombone and tuba slash ophiclide comes in here to really shore up that bottom end as the music arrives at this 5-7 chord. And then, of course, this delicious C minor 7th chord right in here. And then, starting here on this first screen, that wonderful combination of double timpani pizzicato chords in the double basses and the snarling stopped horns. So simple, just two voices right in there, and they're so effective. It does not need to be a big chorus of brass players at all times. Berlioz shows how much impact you can get out of the minimal amount of instruments, even though he was a great orchestrator of sprawling textures. Contrast is key. So think about all of those things. Think about how the bassoons come in, you can really hear them in the recording, just very beautifully underlining. And yet they fit in to the overall sound of this chorale right here with our stopped horns. Then I will see you in a couple of screens.
you'll notice that I cut off through the middle of the bar on that previous screen. So we can start right here on this single note, and I don't have to bring in all of those other instruments here for the beginning of this very simple melody in cellos and double basses. Starting on this high G, it's really, really a great place for double basses, sounding down an octave, of course and really great for them to be playing in octaves with the cellos. And this is such a great melody, our first theme, really, for this particular movement. Bum, 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 bum. At the beginning, wasn't exactly a theme. It was just a fragment of motive. Now here we are getting an actual theme, and notice how just looking across this page, there is a certain downward curve in our dynamics every single time. Starting fortissimo and then getting softer once the instrument has established its presence with the audience's ear. So after the first statement ends here, we have the violas coming in and helping out with the harmony along with a little bit of bassoon in there as well. Notice that the bassoon is not actually doubling any of the pitches that are being played by the string instruments at all, except for this D right in here. And it really just depends on what kind of sound the orchestra is used to. Some bassoonists are really great at playing a particular timbre that blends right in with the strings, so you just feel like the strings got a little fuller there. Other bassoonists like to have a more mixed sound in situations like this, where you really feel the bassoons plus the strings, and you end up with a lovely hybrid kind of a texture. I feel that the orchestra on this recording does a little bit of both. The second bassoon tends to blend in a little bit more with the strings, and the first bassoon doesn't really play out, but has their own identity inside the harmony. Of course, they're playing just right over the top of the violas, so it's hard for them to pretend to be another viola. But what's wonderful about this is Berlioz's foresight. He is making sure that the bassoons have really warmed up their lips and they're ready to go on this great solo to happen. Unison solo. All right, I'll just say it one more time. Don't use the word unison on your wind and brass parts. This is something that comes from Berlioz's original score. Nowadays, our practice is not to say unison on those parts. It is to say a four if you have four bassoons, which we've got here. So, before we get to that, though, let's see what happens with our strings. If you look at the double bass slash cello part, you'll see that the same thing happens again, right? The parts are pretty much identical going forwards until you get to right here, this bar. What do the violas do? They come in and they play harmony up a third, from the cellos. So you'll have this octave with the double basses sounding on this G here, the cellos on this top G, and then up a third on B flat, we've got the violas playing. And it has such a wonderful sound. And of course, it's the same exact thing happening dynamically and in terms of the overall thrust of the thematic material. And that just provides the backdrop for off four bassoons, and it really has this wonderful, throaty, scary sound. Something that you will probably notice me saying in a lot of literature and advising about the doubling of instruments is that usually bassoons are not doubled in their tenor register. That is the place where they sound the best when they are allowed to play solo just a single solo instrument, rather than solely an exposed part. 
But here, Berlioz has got the bassoons to play this very high line, going all the way up to G and then to A. And it really exposes something kind of urgent and medieval about the bassoons. And I think that in a case like this, it works great. However, that's not the same as two bassoons playing solely, which I feel would show more imperfections and would be more difficult to play convincingly. There is something about doubled winds that tends to take away a bit of the sense of intimacy. Of course, this is not a passage that is supposed to be intimate. It's supposed to be kind of barbaric. <laughs> the tragedy of the condemned man is what we're seeing here. So this passage comes to an end here, and notice the sudden diminuendo, so that the bassoons join in with the string harmony right in here, sort of losing their identity as a melodic line by the time they get to this E flat. Now we have the horns coming in, and you're probably looking at this and saying, wow, look at those low Cs, is that even playable? Now remember that this is an E flat horn, and what's really cool about this low C here, sounding E flat below the staff, in other words, it's exactly the same pitch as this, and what's cool about it is that on today's standard double horn, you can only get that sound. It's only available on one place on the horn, and that is on the F side of the horn with one valve down, which essentially is the same tubing that would occur on a natural horn in E flat. So, <laughs> Natural horn or not, it's the same exact length of tubing, it's the same exact note, and it sounds fantastic. Those low sounding E flats on horn are just a great, great sound. It's a very secure note for your fourth horn player to be playing, and of course, played along with four bassoons, that's even better. Or if you don't have the bassoons, or if you'd rather not have it be a bassoon mixed sound, you could also have second and fourth play that together with a really secure, really ominous note. That would be written B flat in the bass staff for your F horns if you are going to do this in your own scoring. Bringing that kind of major color to what was inherently a minor passage, right? Starting on G, ending on G, going through a G minor scale twice. And here, despite having a G and a B flat, these big low E flats bring this wonderful color in. And I think it's kind of funny that we've got the same notation for this note of three ledger lines, but of course, since this is treble clef, that is a high E flat, not a high G, but still very fun. We just go through the same thing, starting on an E flat, ending on an E flat, two octaves down. Notice how the second violin just gives up right here because it can't get to the F and the E flat that the first violins are playing an octave lower. So that is when the violas come in here. And what is everybody else doing in the strings? They are playing this lovely little counter melody here. And notice that they are playing unison. Not the double basses, of course, playing an octave lower, but the violas and the cellos are playing this all unison. So when they get to this point where the violas kind of have to give up, they cannot reach this B flat down in here and the cellos and double basses are getting lower and lower for the next few beats. It's perfectly fine for the violas to just cover that part right in here. And then 
continuing the melody in octaves with the violins that provides some harmony on the outside of this very cool bass line. Is it a bass line or a counter melody? It's a little bit of both. Berlioz does that a lot, as we've seen in previous movements. So I think it's a just a wonderful, happy mixture of the two, of course, being played over this drone in our timpani. At this point, the strings and the timpani establish the dominant for our E-flat tonic that arose in the middle of the last screen. So when we get to that five, everybody reacts in a sort of a coarse way. I think this was supposed to be like the mockery of the crowd. And you could put that into a programmatic context. Our hero, who is being taken away in chains, tried to put a brave face on it when the music modulated to E flat. And of course, the crowd, seeing his look of determination and courage, just mocked him. Maybe that is what is being expressed here. And you'll see it's extremely lusty scoring here. Let's take it apart really quickly. Notice that the bassoons are exactly doubling what's going on here in our second and third trombones. Then we've got our cornets right in here, basically playing C flat, B flat, B flat. And those same exact notes are being played down an octave as we saw in the bassoons and doubled by the first clarinet. Then we've got this F right in here in the second clarinet being doubled by our trombones. And our trumpets are playing D thirds right in the middle, catching that same F and also providing the mediant on a D. Of course, we've got our ophiclide underlining the root. Same thing with our left stage timpani and these rips right in here by our lower strings and by the E-flat horns who are playing essentially a B-flat octave in the bass staff but scored here as G's in the treble staff. Underlining the same mediant that we saw in the second trumpet, we've got sounding D octaves on our B-flat horns. And then above that, just a little bit of harmonic spice here with flutes on B-flat thirds and oboes on B-flat octaves. It's a little debatable whether or not anybody will hear the second oboe, but that's all right. Fortissimo, notice this kind of smear effect that's implied by this hairpin right here. Probably it's better for those players who are involved with this line here to come in a little bit hotter than everybody else, even at fortissimo. So you get this bump. In other words, these notes are not intended to be played forte at the end of the hairpin. They should be fortissimo. So it's just really almost like accenting or putting a tenuto on the first note. So just really pushing and then letting off a little bit when you get to there. So that the first note really comes off as this raucous kind of a laugh. Now we're back to E flat. Despite the laughter of the crowd, our hero is going to keep his brave face going with these nice low E flat octaves, written C's. Now when you've got E flat horns, one way that you can really easily read what's going on on the page is to pretend that it is a bass staff and transpose everything up an octave. So just put a bass staff there and think of these as B flat octaves. And then of course, these look like E flats in bass staff, but just think of them up an octave. So we're continuing on with that same idea as well. Starting strong on an E flat and diminuendo towards the next E flat down, just walking our way down. It's the same exact thing again with the violas taking over. And if there are these kind of duplicates of passages, that is totally acceptable because this is a march. It is not a sonata allegro. After the strings get down to that other E flat, they've got to get us back to G minor somehow. 
So <clears throat> this is all just transitional. And I really like the reaction. So this chord is hit very strong, and then you've got the ba ba kind of syncopation from our winds above, just reacting to it. And it's a really, really great way of having different orchestral sections call and respond. So trombones plus ophiclides with a nice big hit on our left side timpani and this chord right in here, and then the winds and so on, going back and forth. Now look at all these triple stops. They're all really playable. Any triple stop that has got sixths in it is very easy to finger on the fingerboard. So, especially here, when you have got your D sixth and the D is just an open note, and then this G at the bottom is also open, and you just play an E flat sixth together with it, and then the D and the A will be open with the F sharp on top. So those are all really, really simple. And then here we've got an open G at the bottom with an F sixth above, very, very easy to finger. And this is not quite as easy because it's got a perfect fifth in it, the C to G, but it's still doable for a pro. And then F sharp C and A all put together, that's fine. And then here, the viola's got it really easy because all I've got to do is hit this open G at the bottom and then add a G third above and then an E flat sixth and then open D on the bottom with the same C on top. This is, you might think, leading to something really enormous, but it isn't. And here I need to bring something up, not just about the structure of this movement, but the structure of these lectures. I'm covering this shorter movement of four minutes or so, four to five minutes, in three lectures. Everything that we have witnessed so far in this movement is really just a big warm-up to the massive theme that we're going to explore in the second lecture. So there really is a lot of warming up to do. And then once that theme is fully stated, there's a repeat and you go back to the beginning back to the snarly horns and then the bassoons coming in with their solo and everything else. Now many orchestras tend to just ignore the repeat and continue on with the rest of the symphony because it really does end up stating that theme a lot if you add the repeat. The orchestra of Franz Liszt Weimar Music University that allowed me to use this recording, they also skipped the repeat and I think it really makes sense. It's one of those decisions, it just has to do with the decision of the conductor, the vibe of the orchestra, a lot of other things. And I feel it was a right decision in this particular instance. Maybe not in every instance. Sometimes the energy of the movement really does kind of require that you leave out a repeat from time to time. Listen for all of those things the call and response between the strings, lower brass, timpani, and the winds kind of reacting with the syncopation. Listen for how the composer is keeping a brave face on things, despite the raucous jeers from the crowd, who really have not got his best interests at heart. And, of course, for those beautiful low E-flat octaves being played by the horns, and how they kick off that passage of bravery in the face of doom. And then, naturally, the beginning of that theme in the context of G minor, with the bassoons coming in and merging very, very nicely in this recording, I feel. Those players in that orchestra did an excellent job. And, of course, the little solo over that theme being played by the bassoons a4, which really is an awesome sound in a somewhat chilling way. It is very, very chilling. So keep that in mind. If you're going to push your bassoons A2 or A3, however many bassoons you're allowed to score for in whatever commission that you might do, if you have that same idea, it really has an emotional context that I think you have to respect and not just assume that your little experiment is going to work for its own sake, right? It really, there has to be a certain context and a certain purpose 
in order to make it come off as well as you might imagine. Listen to both of those screens and we will take on one more screen in this lecture where the bassoons return with a vengeance. That takes us right back to G minor on a pizzicato in the strings and a light tap by the right side timpanist and the horns are playing a very basic G minor triad with a G minor third on the E flat horns and a B flat third on the B flat horns. Remember that our first and second player are playing B flat basso. And that is an urgent concern of Berlioz, the justification for which we will see in the next lecture when he has the first and second horn playing an octave under his natural trumpets on the main theme. And then, of course, just nice punchy G minor chord voicings here in our winds. And the bassoon starting their awesome solo. This is one of those solos that is considered to be audition repertoire. In order to get into the orchestra, you've got to be able to play this solo, which really goes on and on and on. And it requires careful choices of where to breathe and how to continue enunciating all of those staccatos and all of these other things. And generally speaking, you are given the first and second bassoonist part rather than the third and fourth bassoonist part where there's a little easing off in the lower part. But before we get into this <laughs> amazing solo, let's look at what the accompaniment is doing. We've got that same theme starting on G and going down to G and so on and so forth. And here in the upper strings, Berlioz has the violins and violas go the opposite direction. Notice that at the beginning, they are an octave lower <laughs> than the cellos. The double basses are playing the same pitch as the violins and violas, but the cellos are an octave above. So the two parts cross right around here with the cellos dipping under and the upper strings going over. But then, of course, when we get to this point, the violas drop down the octave to lower F sharp just because they can, and the parts intersect again. And then at this point, by the time you get to this G and the violas, we have a big stack of G octaves, and then they go their separate ways. Very, very simple, contrary motion kind of counterpoint. I really love how the upper strings arrive at this F sharp right here at the same time that the cellos and double basses arrive at A. I mean, I mean, of course, that's just built right into the scale, but it's just so cool how Berlioz fits that into his mad schemes. And then, of course, everybody gets to the G at the same time, and then they start going back towards each other. And at this point, the integrity of the original theme is broken up so that Berlioz can throw in a lot of little cadences, 451, 451, and so on. But he is actually leading to his main theme, which is going to hit us in the face on the next screen in the next lecture. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. So that is what is accompanying our bassoons. And it's entertaining enough on its own. However, adding the bassoons 
we see that they're covering, to begin with, arpeggiated chords that fit in with the harmony of the contrapuntal lines. Then when you get to the third bar, you see the bassoons doing more of their own thing, taking this particular little motive, C up a third, walking down, and so on, into its own little idea, inverting it right in here, reversing it there, and so on. This is really cool right here, where we have half the bassoons jumping up the octave, and everything playing in octaves, and then rejoining back together, right as he's setting up the cadence, and it feels seamless. So great. So when these D octaves are hit as part of this D major chord right in here, then the bassoons right afterwards come in on this low D, and it's imperceptible unless you're really listening for it. The bassoons fit their solo into this series of cadences stacked one after the other. But there's one cool little spot right in here with these thirds, first coming in here on F sharp and A, and then of course walking up, and then here down a third from there, and finally ending on this bop 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 just sounds so cool right in here. It has this wonderful motoristic feeling to it. And right at that point, our first ophiclide comes in, going back and forth with these B flat octaves. And our timpani on the left and right hand side of the stage start playing back and forth. And I'll talk about this more in the next lecture. Here's where you really feel the orchestra marching. And it's such a cool idea. And possibly the inspiration to begin with for the whole idea of putting different groups of timpani on different sides of the stage. If the orchestra does that, then you really feel this wonderful impulse in what you're hearing as your ears sort of flex back and forth to the pounding of the timpani on either side of the stage. Got to hand it to Berlioz. He just was a fountain of great, interesting concepts and huge leaps forward. At this point, the timpani ends right on this final G minor chord, right? B flat, G, and the same G in the violas, D below. And this could easily be played as a double stop as well because you've got your open G and then a fingered D on the C string. And then our G octaves finally allowing the basses and the cellos to really inhabit their lower register. And then from there we get this big rip upwards. And that leads us to what we're going to talk about in the next lecture, that wonderful March theme. But before we get into that, just listen to all of those things, the kind of pounding March really, really kicking into gear right in here. And then before that, how the strings are walking apart here in a very simple contrary motion. The upper strings doing basically the reverse of the lower strings in flipping that same exact theme. And then how everything comes together here, just returning over and over again in those same four, five, one cadences. And how the bassoons fit into that with these broken chords and then these little fragments of motive all sort of chuckling away and reaching very, very high up here to high B flat. Not the most common note during that time, but certainly playable. And then how things come together here as this cadence goes forward from five to one, coming together on this D in the bassoons, and then the very natural way they all join together again in unison on this D following right away. And then how they all conspire together <laughs> to drive home the push back to the one chord over and over again until they all lift off together going towards the key of B flat. So listen to all of those things and I hope the fragmentary form of this lecture isn't too spread out. Some people like to hear the music more often and compare it to the screen a little faster than others, so maybe this will help them. But I kind of feel 
it's great to just talk extensively about one section and then play the music and then extensively about another section and play the music again in these lectures. It just seems to work better. But the next movement is going to take us to the end of this first repeated section. And then some of those same ideas in the repeated section are going to be basically copied and pasted forwards with a few little changes. So that just makes it a lot easier with the way that this particular lecture is framed. So enjoy that. Enjoy those awesome bassoons. And I will see you for the next lecture very, very soon. Thank you.